Welcome to Pete's Property Podcast, brought to you by Buyers Buyers and hosted by Pete Wargent, buyers agent, finance and real estate expert, and all-round property guru, plus published author. Join Pete for 30 minutes as he chats all things property with a new guest each week. Learn practical tips from the movers and shakers in the property industry and well-known personalities sharing their property journeys. G'day, welcome to the Pete Wardgen Property Pod this week. It's an absolute honour to have a very special guest, Mr. Michael Pascoe, aristocrat of Australian business and economics reporting and journalism over, dare I say, a fair few years. Michael, welcome. It's absolutely excellent to have you on. Thank you, Pete. And to steal a line from someone else after an introduction like that, I can't wait to hear myself. Heavens. <laughs> Uh, hopefully it won't all be downhill from there. I, uh, I'll i try my best not to make it so. So um, for those who may not be familiar, give us a little bit of background on yourself. I, I could read out a, a biography, but it's sometimes better to come straight from the horse's mouth, so to speak. So tell us a bit about your career, uh, your background, and where did you come from? Sure. My name is Michael Pascoe. I was born as a baby and grew up to become a boy in Queensland. I was actually born in Mizelki Peterson's electorate in a one pub town. I made a political statement and left when I was 18 months old. Uh, My boyhood was spent in Petrie when it was a country town outside Brisbane as opposed to a suburb now. And that was a great Tom Sawyer sort of existence. My, My father was a country copper. So the family had moved around police stations uh, in mainly the Burnett, but yeah, country Queensland. And there was a little property lesson there because country coppers, of course, lived in the police station house. And my parents did not need to buy a house and didn't buy a house until they were absolutely mature. That's a mistake people don't want to make, as many people in Australia are finding out now. My family learnt that lesson early, that if you've got free housing, don't just rely on the free housing. So, uh, look, got a, I was very fortunate that I scored a cadetship on the Courier-Mail, and in those days, you tended to do that straight out of school, and that was a long time ago, 1973, so the thick end of half a century in journalism. Uh, and you, you studied part-time. I ran away to Hong Kong, worked on the South China Morning Post, travelled a bit, came back to Australia, moved to Sydney, joined the Financial Review, went downhill from there, really, into broadcast, lured into broadcast journalism. The Finn Review period was a golden era. It comes to mind because the Finn's been celebrating its 70th anniversary. I was having lunch with a couple of old friends yesterday and we thought we were very lucky to have worked on the Fin Review during its golden era. Max Walsh was the editor. Max Such was running Fairfax newspapers. It was pro-markets. It was pro-capitalism, but also pro-reform. Not a cheer squad for business. Not a uh, uncritical cheer squad for what passes for Australian management. I was lured out of that into 2GB when they thought there might be something in business journalism process was repeated for Channel 9. I was nearly 18 years as the Nine Network Finance Editor, started a show called Business Today and uh, was one of the founding team for Business Sunday. Then um, John Alexander became CEO and he fired me from Channel 9. No love lost there. (laughs) I uh, proceeded to do some work for Channel 7, a bit of work for the old Sky and um, started writing a column for the Sydney Morning Herald, which went on for many years until I was fired from there by James Chessel. No love lost there either. (laughs) And uh, the New Daily was very quickly on the phone and convinced me to start writing for them. So I'm now contributing editor for the New Daily. Heavens knows what I'll do when I grow up. Yeah, you must uh, really enjoy it because uh, even when you left um, uh, Fairfax and Sydney Morning Herald, or so, it wasn't long before you were into the new gig at the New Daily. And I certainly, uh, when I only first came to Sydney in the 1990s, and I, I remember certainly in the mid 2000s, you were basically the king of Australian uh, business and economics journalism. Your face was everywhere on every TV channel, or you know, and then the the Website started doing um, sort of uh, video casts as well. 
what what do you think made you so good at that? I always um, got the impression you had you just had a knack for uh, making a story relatable. But you also, uh, if you don't mind me saying, you're very suave and uh, had a very smooth delivery. It just it all seemed to come naturally to you. Did, what do you think was your big strength there? I think flattery is going to get you nowhere today, Peter. <laughs> uh, look, I'm sure there are a bunch of other journalists who would dispute that and they'd claim they would be kings at that time. But I think I was very lucky in that I enjoy communicating and I find communicating fairly easy. I also thought that a key part of my job was to turn arcane economics into something understandable. I mean, I had to understand it first, therefore I had to make it simple so I could understand it and translate that to human beings um, from economics into into human language. An early realisation was that business reporting, sports reporting, crime reporting, any sort of reporting you care to think of, the basics are pretty much the same. And I used to say business reporting in particular because I was part of that wave to begin broadcast business reporting. I think I had the first free-to-wear business program uh, in Australia ever, and now, of course, there's you know wall-to-wall business reporting, that it's a bit like sport. You know, you had to know the players, you had to know the coaches, you had to know the teams, you had to know the rules of the game, and you were looking at the form of businesses and economic trends. The other matter is that economics is fascinating, gets hidden in jargon, and it gets tortured by some fairly boring people, but it is actually a fascinating way to look at the world. And I've got some economist friends, one of whom has always reminded me that a key part of it, a key part of good economic thinking is to look at the opportunity cost of a decision. You always should be looking at the dog that doesn't bark. If you take that attitude to journalism more broadly, you're looking at, well, okay, if you do this, what's the opportunity cost? What's the counterfactual? What's the dog that doesn't bark in any situation? And that's fascinating because there's always something hidden or nearly always something hidden that's worth finding out about. I agree. I mean, you can get some very dry sets of numbers that get reported from the Statistical Bureau, but it's really when you can dig into those numbers, there's always a story in there, especially as it relates to people, demographics, you know, housing markets, as we'll talk about. You know, there's there's always something in there, uh, and sometimes it takes a bit of uh, digging to find the story. And I guess, as you said, that was one of the things you were always able to do so well. You actually made finance watchable, uh, certainly as compared to how it was taught at college or school. You know, it could often be very dry. Now, you mentioned that you started uh, journalism the uh, best part of 50 years ago. Obviously, a lot has changed in the world since then, and particularly in journalism. So what would you say, I know we get a lot of younger listeners on the podcast, what would you say to somebody who is thinking of going into a career in journalism or finance journalism today? Because obviously, even in the past 20 years, there's been a huge change in the way in which uh, journalism is reported, people are employed. I guess there's more freelancing and contracting these days. So do you have any tips or recommendations for youngsters today? Journalism has never been easy to get into. There have always been a lot of people applying for the available positions. But journalism is not the comfortable middle-class job that it used to be. It is improving a little bit at the moment. There seems to be a bit more hiring going on, but it's a tough gig. What I would say to people is you have to be really sure you want to do it. If it's the thing you're meant to do, if you have, dare I say it, the vocation, you won't be happy doing anything else. And so you have to do it. It's not a matter of choice. You've just got to do it. But if you're not sure, there's a good chance you won't last. And even in the group that I started with all those years ago, yeah, people drop out because it's it's not necessarily easy and it's competitive. You've got to be lucky and you've got to have talent. It helps to be lucky and have some talent. You can get by with one or the other, but it helps to have two. So it's a tough gig and the, the money is not very good. 
purse strings are being loosened a little bit just now, but given the reality of Google and Facebook controlling most of the advertising revenue, advertising-supported journalism is not going to be terribly, not going to get make you rich, that's for sure. But it comes down to if you want to do it, you're not going to be happy doing anything else anyway. And there are opportunities that come along. Um, you know, I think the ABC does a fantastic job, but not everyone can work for the ABC. I don't think commercial television news, um, it's, it tries to do a hell of a lot with not too many resources, and that's a hard gig. The newspapers in this country, I'm not sure that they are quite as good as they used to be. I might be just becoming a, an old man. But on the other hand, on the positive side, there is the rise of more independent journalism and more voices. Uh, the New Daily being one of them, The Guardian, which didn't exist in this country until fairly recently. You've got uh, Michael West Media. You've, you know, there is a variety of al alternatives that are proving quite resilient. And I think that is cause for a little bit of optimism anyway. Do you want to save on buyer's agent fees? You could save thousands with Buyer's Buyers. As Australia's most extensive network of buyer's agents, we can lock in highly competitive prices. Plus, our national network of buyer's agents are some of the best in the business. So get the buyer's buyer's advantage and talk to us today. Call 1800 975 051 or visit buyersbuyers.com.au. The rate of change in the past 20 years suggests that being open minded and flexible might almost be a prerequisite these days. So let's talk a bit about your property market journey. You must have a few tales over all those decades. I, um, as you know, lived in Sydney for a decade or so, probably a bit longer, and um, I passed across the time or two. I think I remember a bit uh, Chris Caton's leaving bash um, at BT. I, I think uh, we must have crossed paths there alongside uh, Ross Gittins and Peter Martin and Rory Robertson and a few others. But then I moved up to Alanda Street on Sunshine Beach, and who should I see knocking around the surf club in Sunshine Beach but you as well? So we seem to have uh, uh, mirrored each other's uh, journeys in some way. So I guess these days as you're moving towards the end game, you obviously spend a bit of time in southeast Queensland as well. So tell us a bit about when you bought your first property and uh, uh, what's the end game for you? The end? I'm not dead yet. <laughs> Hey, look, I, I, say that, I say that even to people uh, many years younger than yourself. I'm, I'm interested in uh, people's goals and, uh, and uh, particularly as, uh, as my superannuation gets closer, I'm often interested to hear what people are planning for the end game. Yeah. Well, the beginning of the story, first property, we, we came to Sydney. Obviously, if you're in Australia, we came back to Australia at the end of 1979 you had to be in Sydney because that's where journalism was. That's where the, the best newspapers were. That were They were the bad old days when banks would only give you a loan if you didn't need to have a loan, um, roughly speaking. That was when housing home loans were capped at 13.5%, which was considered a bargain, and you had to save a lot of money with the bank before they'd tend to give you a loan. And there were ways around it. We found one of them. Our first property was a one-and-a-half-bedroom unit in Kirribilli, so we got lucky early. We had been looking for quite a while, couldn't find anything that we could afford, and then on one weekend we found two properties that we could we could do. One was that one-and-a-half-bedroom unit with no parking in Kirribilli. The other was a quite nice townhouse up on the beaches, Narrabeen Lakes. And that's one of those sliding door moments. What would, have our, what would our life have been if we'd been northern beaches people as opposed to very lower north shore people i think i was given some good advice by a, a, a colleague on the fin review at the time who also when he came to sydney he was advised two things work out where your lifestyle is because sydney isn't one city it's you know 20 or 30 cities and you find the one that suits you and if you can afford it go for it and the other lesson for Sydney property was you bite off a bit more than you can chew and you chew like crazy. 
which certainly works, except for those brief times when poor devils who might find themselves buying at the top of the boom and therefore suffer for a decade thereafter. So anyway, we bought a one and a half bedroom unit in Kirribilli. Um, there was a property crash around that time. Not too long thereafter, we were able to get a much bigger, better unit, bought into a small block with a bunch of other young people, and we all did up our own units and did well out of that. And then as the family grew, we moved to suburbia and to housing. We uh, spent 23 years in Longable, which was a fantastic secret it used to be. Uh, and we have downsized now to a smaller house as the, the four sons of Flo and the Coop um, over McMars Point Way. So that's where we live. Noosa, that was our beach growing up before all you bloody Southerners and foreigners invaded, before the Victorians moved in with their with their odd football. I'll tell you what, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of blow-ins there today, particularly, I think, with the pandemic. I mean, there's Victorian licence plates wherever you look, but um, I guess it's been that way for a number of years. It's become phenomenally popular now, for good reason, I think. A lot of people... You know, finding that lifestyle, it's relatively easy to get to Sydney if you need to. And um, I think a lot more people with flexible working arrangements now. So uh, so you have a toehold in the, the Noosa market as well, I gather. We bought a place at Sunshine Beach um, yeah, a long time ago now, quite a while ago, early 2000s. Sunshine Beach, we remember driving up there when the surveyor's pegs were first going out and thinking, who'd want to live at Sunshine Beach? It's out in the sticks. Yeah, okay, so we bought a place there, and we're very happy because that's still Queensland, unlike Noosa Heads itself, which is a bit of Victoria. We noticed when we can get there, when the sugarcane curtain opens for a minute or two, last time we were up, we did notice a change in the vibe of the place because it did go through a stage of being a bit of an old people's home. You know, restaurants would start taking dinner, you know, serving dinner at 5.30 and they'd be closed at 8 o'clock. This time round, while there was still a lot of people who weren't young, you got the sense that they were there to work, not to retire. And, and that is something that one of these days someone will do some figures and find out about it. But you, you could just feel the vibe of the place, that there was more money being spent and people weren't just going there to die. They were going there to live, which I think is very good for it. That stretch south of Noosa, Sunshine Beach, and further south, it's, it's just a magic bit of coast anyway. I, I think it's the best beach in the world. I've seen a lot of them. I can't understand anyone going overseas for a beach holiday. We go overseas when we can, but we don't go to a beach because what's the point? It's going to be disappointing. And that lifestyle element, is interesting. How long it lasts, I'm not too sure. I have a lot of faith in the power of the market. There are a lot of office buildings in central business districts that are offering cheap rent. I think that will in time reinvigorate the CBDs and you will have another generation that needs for all the Zooming we've been doing, I don't think there's a substitute for that socialisation around the workplace to throw up ideas to move businesses on. No, so I mean, I've, I've, I've seen, I've been in London just this uh, week and uh, the, the, it's absolutely rammed with people. Now, some of it is Christmas shopping and tourism, but it's it's also people just getting back. I think a lot of people have had enough of Skype and Zoom and all these other things, which have fulfilled a purpose. But I think the thing as well in Australia, the demographics of Sydney and Melbourne is largely driven by new migrants. You know, new migrants typically go to Sydney and Melbourne in that order. And when the borders open, I expect a lot of that will resume. So you must be, I guess, pretty happy with um, the Sunshine Beach market because it's probably one of the few housing markets that could hold it candle to uh, cryptocurrency returns in recent years, certainly Sunshine Beach. But obviously there is a, a flip side to that because you mentioned there's been a lot of very established money in markets like uh, Sunshine Beach and others in Noosa, but it's particularly hard for first timers to get into the market. What sort of advice would you have for first home buyers today? Um, obviously it's a bit different, very different dynamic today. As you mentioned, banks might 
uh, be a bit freer with their lending, much lower mortgage rates, but the deposit is obviously the challenge. Any tips for the first timers? Rich parents, obviously that's a very good idea. I didn't do it, but back in my day, I didn't have to do it. Now it's extremely hard if you didn't choose wealthy parents or relatively wealthy parents. There is no easy tip. Uh, it, it is a matter having to save like crazy, having to withstand temptation in the process, and when you can get a loan, get it. It's getting on the ladder that you've got to do. You've got to buy what you can afford to buy and make do with it. You see a lot of people always chasing the market up in this crazy market we've been in, and not just this pandemic boom when there's been a shortage of stock pressing things to ridiculous levels. The boom before this boom, it was hard and heartbreaking to watch young people, including my own children, chasing markets higher, deciding they can afford to spend X dollars and they go to the auction and it goes for X plus. And so they change their horizon. Okay, we'll do Y dollars. And by the time they've saved that deposit, uh, <clears throat> so it's getting into that, that first purchase that gives you the security. Look, all appreciating assets are good assets, as long as they're real assets, not crypto rubbish. Appreciating assets are what you have to put your money into. And that's most obviously shares and property in this country. So you've got to be in the game to get on the ladder. If you don't take that first step, you're stuffed. Right now, saving money when you get no interest is really hard. And if you're going to need that money for a deposit, it's kind of tricky to put it in the stock market because the stock market goes up and down too. But it's going to take you a while to get there. So I would think someone with an eye to doing it would be saving some of their money in boring, good dividend-paying shares that at least will keep up with the game and they won't be falling behind as they try to get there. I wish I had some secret formula. I don't. Buy what you can afford and be prepared to move. I think one of the more pathetic stories, of the most pathetic stories I saw during one of the previous property booms in Sydney was this sad little sob story children who had grown up in the eastern suburbs not being able to afford to live where they grew up. Well, um, yeah, so you've got to live where you can afford to live. And that can move, mean moving into state. Uh, Pete, you pointed out to me years ago that that standard sort of formula, the arbitrage between Sydney and Brisbane, um, you know, it fluctuates, but when that gap opens up, Brisbane's a better place to live and buy. Ditto Adelaide, as long as your work will allow you to do it. You've got to be prepared to be mobile. There's another side to this equation, and which we'll come on to in a second, about the lack of affordable rental or social housing. Just before we come on to that, though, you, you, you made a good point there about the alternative investment choices that people have today. You've got, particularly in Australia, the way the tax system is, you've basically got the stock market and the housing market, you know, things like fixed interest investments just aren't that attractive for a range of reasons um, at the moment, but with the tax system as well. Now, years ago, when I used to live in uh, Sydney's eastern suburbs, I caught up a time or two with um, Peter Thornhill, who you would know of, um, wrote a classic investment book called Motivated Money, I'm guessing here, probably about early 2000s, something like that. And uh, it made a very strong case for uh, basically, spend less than you earn and put the rest into stocks and just keep buying stocks. You know, but that's an abbreviated version or the too long, didn't read version. Now, I've read somewhere or other, possibly in the Sydney Morning Herald back in those days, that you're a fan of uh, Peter Thornhill's messaging and um, approach to investing and so on. And in fact, you have a preference for the stock market over property. Is that is that a fair assessment for, for from an investment perspective? From a purely investment perspective, which is different from where you live, a purely perspective, investment perspective, yes, I do like stocks over investment property. Because you get more diversity, you know, someone has one or maybe two investment properties, that's a lot of eggs in one or two baskets. I don't think people starting out in investment property ever estimate the real cost of, of, of an investment property. 
I also like to think that at some stage in Australia, we will actually have a housing policy, which might mean that um, it's not just a one-way bet the way it's working at the moment. But you've got to have both. The biggest investment most people make is the house they live in. And that is that there's another factor in there. It's not just what will make you the most money, but what will keep you out of poverty. Because if you don't own your own house by the time, your own home by the time you retire, you're going to be living in poverty more likely than not. So it's not just a, a cold, hard work out the percentages of investment. It is also the lifestyle of owning your own place, being able to do what you want with it, and the forced saving that comes with a mortgage. Because most of us aren't good at being good. Most of us aren't very disciplined. So when you buy your own home and you have to make that mortgage payment, you bloody well make it and you actually build up an asset, which is absolutely crucial come retirement time. Yeah, so I have a theory that maybe that one of the reasons there's more equity and wealth in the housing market than in stocks is simply that factor. It's the forced saving plus it's actually pretty hard to sell a property at short notice. You know, you, you pretty much, once you're in, you tend to stick with it for the long run. Whereas, I mean, as you know, on social media these days, the stock market commentary is almost by the hour or by the minute sometimes. And it's probably maybe psychologically harder for many people to stick with it in the stock market, p- partly because of the daily the daily commentary. Well, I've, been, I've, I've been guilty of that. I mean, I, for a quarter of a century, I was doing daily market reports, having to find excuses for why something went up or down <laughs> by uh, a little bit. And, and it was mostly, to use a technical term, bullshit. Um, okay, there were big movements and there were big trends, but most of the daily commentary is rubbish. And the biggest mistake you can make is to actually look at your portfolio on a daily basis. Forget about it. I mean, the the Pasco Family Super Fund, I might look at uh, how it's going once a month. It's set and forget. I'm not a trader. Uh, You actually require skill to be a trader and dedication and a fixation to do it. And most people end up not being good at it. One of the problems, I think, for people who have uh, been lured or had the time and the money during COVID lockdown to start playing the market is that it looks so easy because we are in the biggest bubble of everything ever. And so people think they're geniuses by buying stock X and watching it go up. Eh, It's not that easy when things return to normal. Yes, that's right. It's uh, the the tide can go in, in two different directions. Now, one of the the reasons that I think um, investment property has been popular in Australia is well, the tax system kind of encourages it, and I think a part of that is that the public sector or the government just owns very little housing stock. And I mentioned I've been in London recently, and famously in the Thatcher years, a lot of the council housing was sold off so people could get onto the ladder. But these days in London, I've noticed around the traps, if you go to places like uh, Wembley and other parts of town, there's a lot of um, build-to-rent projects come online. So where corporations have effectively, they're offering security of tenure for renters. So that's one market solution that's being found. Um, It's had its teething issues, I guess, in terms of uh, the quality of the repairs and so on and the maintenance that gets done and there's been a lot of uh, toing and froing between tenants and landlord there but what do you think Australia should do in terms of tackling affordable social housing and rentals and so on because it's not really been tackled very well to say the least. Governments here Pete have been running away from social housing for decades. Uh, There was a report out last month pointing out that the number of social housing units available in Australia is pretty much exactly what it was 20 years ago. And in that time, our population has gone through the roof and the availability of social housing, affordable housing, has not. Uh, It annoys me that all the coverage of the housing crisis tends to be about first-home buyers. And, yeah, it's tough if you're a first-home buyer trying to get in, but that's not where the real crisis is. There's a relatively small number of wannabe first-home buyers And they tend to get there in the end. The real crisis is with the 
25% or so of the population who will never be able to afford to own a place, who are caught in rental, and only a tiny percentage of those people actually get into government housing and have the security and affordability of government housing. Most of them are at the bottom end of the private rental market, and that tends to be a bloody rough place to be. Rather than do the responsible thing, build and own social housing, governments prefer to subsidise private landlords, prefer to give money to people uh, on low incomes to subsidise their rent. I personally think that's very poor policy. It is propping up a speculative end of the property market that we don't need propped up. Uh, that the government also has the capacity to build on a counter-cyclical basis. We had the opportunity with COVID. The government could have put a whole pile of money very quickly into social housing. It preferred to subsidise the private housing market with the, the home builder and whatever programs that gave money to people who didn't really need the money to do a renovation or to buy a place. And that helped boost prices in a thin market when the government could have employed a whole pile of tradies if they'd been able to move quickly on social housing that would remain a community asset forever. And that's, that's where our real housing crisis is. There are no votes in it, of course, and therefore the politicians tend to ignore it. There are some promising signs. Uh, Victoria putting a bit more money into social housing, still not up to the scale of the of, of the problem. Uh, Labor has announced a, a federal Labor has announced an idea of a, a twenty billion dollar social housing fund. It, it's still not up to the task. You know, you look at one of the most livable house, uh, cities on earth is Vienna. Nearly a third of Vienna housing is government owned and it works very well. We have social stigma around houses, to use the slang for it. You know, we've got yet another housing inquiry underway. You know, Felinski, uh, one of the young liberal members, preempted the inquiry by saying, oh, social housing, that just means house uh, and is ideologically opposed to it. The reality is, Weak wages growth with our low level of pensions, a whole pile of people will not be able to buy a home. They need security. They need to be kept out of poverty if we're any sort of a decent society. Yeah, it's a very, uh, very comprehensive and very well thought out um, answer. So thank you. I appreciate that. Now, my final question for you today, Michael, I'm as we kind of touched on earlier in the chat, I'm one of those annoying blow-in types in Noosa. And in fact, um, as one of those itinerants, I'm pretty much always a newcomer wherever I live in the world. I've lived in Europe, I lived in East Timor for a number of years. And even within Australia, I've lived in Darwin and Sydney and Brisbane. So I've kind of always uh, one of those itchy feet type of people. And I noticed in recent years, it's been particularly during the, the mining boom years that immigration really took off in Australia. We, went, we sort of rolled the mining boom into a, a demographic boom. And I think at the peak, um, population growth was 400,000 or 450,000 in a year. And there was a lot of talk about, right, we really need to cut the migration cap, which did actually happen in 2019. And I, I noticed in the media, there was uh, people like um, yourself and Peter Martin, some of the few voices, I think, in business journalism who are saying, well, hang on, you know, the country is built on immigration. Uh, skilled migrants are typically young, as I was myself in my 20s when I came to Australia. They pay tax for a long time. They bring new skills. You know, they lower the average age and increase the participation rate, all of these sort of benefits of migration. But then there's been a lot of pushback about um, traffic, congestion, overflowing schools, creaking infrastructure. And obviously in the last two years, we've pretty much seen immigration switched off and now wages are rising. A lot of people are saying, well, let's not go back to high immigration setting. So a bit of a convoluted question for you, but this is obviously a very contentious subject at the moment. What do you think that the government should do about immigration settings? Should they go back to how things were? Should they 
increase the cap to solve the skill shortage? What do you think? That's a long question and it deserves a longer <laughs> answer than we have time for, and it's complicated. <laughs> it is complicated, but all right, let me let me state my philosophical position first. I believe in a bigger and better Australia that we need to build for a bigger population. You mentioned some of the benefits of migration. There is a harder to define benefit. The fact of the matter is that most migrants are actually better than most skippies. You have to be good to migrate. You have to be brave to migrate, to leave everything you know behind, to leave your contacts, your friends, your family, your comfort zone, to go and start again in another country. It takes a lot of motivation. You've got to be prepared to have a crack. And on average, migrants certainly do. There was a, a famous quote from Piggy Muldoon, the, the New Zealand Prime Minister, decades ago when the population was shrinking as Kiwis left a depressed economy and came to Australia. Piggy Muldoon said, well, that was improving the IQ of both countries. <laughs> he was only right about one half of it. It was lowering the IQ of New Zealand and it was lifting ours. That migrants bring an energy and drive that we would be lost without. And that is a little bit hard to put a number on. You know, you, you mentioned some of the things that you can enumerate, you know, how much tax you pay, the age, educational qualifications, the drive you can't, and it's important. What we have to do, though, is make the best of cherry-picking the skills that we need to allow one and one to add up to more than two. I think it is wrong just to open the, the door when we haven't built for it to keep wages suppressed. And that is what a lot of the commentary from businesses around the place are now. Oh, look, we're having to pay a lot of money for people who wash dishes. That is not a high-skill job. The idea of importing cheap temporary labour to keep wages down does not appeal to me. I think we should be importing highly skilled, highly paid people. To use the example of hospitality, we haven't been training enough cooks, enough chefs. It's a really tough job. It doesn't get paid well enough, but you've got to have a chef to allow the rest of the restaurant to work. You can train front of house, you need the skills. So let's, by all means, import the chefs while we continue to train our own. That's the value add job. You don't have to just fill in the, the spaces, which we have been tending to do. Um, you know, look at the, the campaign by farmers who want cheap workers who will work in terrible conditions, almost indentured labour, whether they were backpackers or now they're looking at a new Asian crop picker visa, and you think, how well pleased is that going to be? Is that going to be a second-class worker in this country? And I think we are capable of doing better than that. Yes, I mean, that's a good point. And certainly when I applied many years ago now, but it was very hard. I had to be under 30, I had to have three years industry experience as a chartered accountant, I had to have English skills, which I just about scraped through. So it was it was very I was right on the cusp of not having enough, even having deliberately chosen a qualification on the skills shortage list. And I think, yeah, that's some of the criticism in recent years has actually been around that sort of making up the numbers for the sake of making up numbers rather than picking and choosing the skills, which I think actually is what in Europe, people have really envied about Australia's position, that ability to pick you know, the skills uh, that are in demand and required and actually being a net benefit, I guess, to everybody then. So, yeah, it's a very uh, well-articulated response. So, uh, Michael, obviously uh, we could talk all day about um, Queensland demographics and the shift from New South Wales and uh, the IQ of both populations uh, moving accordingly, but I think we should probably call stumps there. So thank you so much for coming on. Um, now, you mentioned these days people can track you down at the New Daily, but I think as well people can uh, troll you on social media at Michael Pasco one on Twitter as well. Anything else you'd like to add? Keep an eye out for a book written by Michael Pasco in the middle of next year. It's not about economics. It's not about politics. It is about mateship and mortality and um, I hope people enjoy that. Well, I didn't even know you had a book to plug and if I'd, if I'd have known that at the outset, I would have made a 
a bigger plug. Maybe we'll put it into the show notes as well for you. So well, definitely. I haven't, I haven't got it to plug yet. That's the problem. It's still bloody months away and it's frustrating. So have me back again and I'll plug the hell out of it. <laughs> Christmas stocking 2022 if we get back to uh, post-COVID days. So, so we'll definitely keep an eye out for that one. Michael, thanks so much again for coming on and uh, hopefully catch you for a coffee in Sunshine Beach soon. Will do. Thanks, Pete. Thanks for listening to Pete's Property Podcast, powered by Buyers Buyers. Don't forget to subscribe and join us next time as Pete chats all things property with a new guest. And just a reminder that the information provided in this podcast is general advice only and doesn't take into account your personal financial situation or needs. You should always consult a licensed professional to discuss your individual personal circumstances.